everything you know about air-to-air -air missiles is wrong. Coming up. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Air-to-air -air missiles are a controversial subject among air-to-air -air simulation enthusiasts. The internet is full of video that demonstrate how to use missiles in games. The forums flourish of head-to-head -head comparisons of different weapons. I am sorry to say, most of these comparisons are not grounded in reality. We simply don't know some elements which are key in determining the missile performances in a real combat situations. We also don't know if what is publicly available is a clever piece of deception or not. However, there is enough reliable public information out there to let us understand better how air-to-air -air missiles really work and how they do affect air-to-air -air combat. The first element to understand is energy. Energy is something that a missile has that gives it the possibility to go somewhere and do something. There are two components to the missile energy. The part of energy associated to its speed and the part of energy associated to its eight. So it is rather intuitive that the faster the missile is, the farther it can go or for a given speed, the quicker it can get there. It is also easy to understand that the higher the missile is, the farther and the longer it can glide and while doing so, pulled by gravity, it can retain its speed. What the missile is doing is converting the energy associated with height into energy associated with speed. Energy is the most important factor to assess missile capacity from a general point of view. For the pilot, it is the main element to consider when firing at the target or escaping from an enemy missile. The best sensor or the most sophisticated guidance system can do nothing if the missile can't get where the target is. The obvious source of energy is the missile engine. Air-to-air -air missiles are powered by solid propellant rocket motors. Air-to-air -air missiles engine burn for just a few seconds. For example, the AM9E, uh, an older version of the famous Sidewinder, has an engine burn of just 2.2 seconds. Air-to-air -air missiles actually can reach a very high speed in a very short amount of time. Normally, the exact speed and the exact parameters are classified, but we can safely assume that an average air-to-air -air missile can fly between Mach, Mach 2 and Mach 3.5. However, despite the high speed, the short burn leaves the missile with no propulsion after a very short time. It is little known and often not considered that air-to-air -air missiles glide toward the target for most of their trajectory. In doing so, they progressively bleed the energy that they acquired in the burn phase. So if the missile energy depends from speed, it is rather intuitive if it is that if it is released by a plane at high speed, it starts its flight with an advantage. However, it is not possible to just add the maximum missile speed to the platform speed because the maximum missile speed is actually a limit speed. So for example, if the plane flies at Mach 1.2, the missile is capable of flying at say Mach 2.5, the top speed won't be Mach 3.7. If the thrust is set, the faster you fly, the higher is the drag. When they cancel each other, you have reached your limit speed. So chances are that the max speed of the missile won't change much, but the acceleration phase will be much shorter, so the missile will be flying at max speed for a longer time 
uh, thus being capable of reaching a target much uh, farther away. Something similar applies to the plane height. Let's suppose that a missile is released at 30,000 feet against a target at 10,000 feet. The missile will have 20,000 feet of energy to spend, well, to dive onto the target, accelerate toward the target and eventually going farther into the process. Also, and this is a very important effect, the higher you go, the lower the high density is. The lower the drag, so the higher the speed and the longest is the reach. The takeaway is the higher and the faster is the plane releasing the missile, the more energy will the missile have to spend to reach its target. The management of the missile energy is so important that it has a direct impact on the trajectory pre-programmed that the missile follows when it is released by its launcher. In films and video games, missiles are shown to fly straight from the launcher to the target, which is actually not wrong, but is just one of the possibilities. It is actually the mode that it is used for short-range engagements or dogfights. Longer-range missiles can use their powered flight phase to reach a higher altitude and then dive onto the target. A famous example of a missile using this type of trajectory is the AIM-54 Phoenix that was used by the, um, F4, the American F-14. The attack from above has a distinct advantage from attack level. Um, try to put yourself on the nose of the missile and picture how the missile is actually seeing the target. If the trajectory is flat, a missile that is trying to reach a target at a higher altitude will quickly bleed its energy because it will have to uh, use its inertia to go against the gravity. If the target is below the missile, the missile is actually falling from above onto the target. The energy required to reach the target will be pretty much the same regardless how the target moves and this is a decisive advantage. Actually, this is such a big advantage that every kind of military missiles, not only air-to-air -air missiles, adopt this kind of trajectory. For example, the famous helicopter launched Hellfire missile does just this. Normally, the exact flight parameters of the missile are actually secret and a very well guarded secret because if you know exactly what is the trajectory that the missile is going to fly you can also find a certain way to outmaneuver it. In film and video games we see the planes wait till the very last fraction of a second and do a sharp turn and outmaneuver the missile. Fact you can't outmaneuver a missile. There is a limit to the turning ability of a plane and it is the resilience of human body. FAR-25 uh, certified civilian airplane, quote, do not need to have a load factor above 3.8, quote. The complete engineering explanation is too long and too nerdy to be covered here. Suffice to say, that the load factor measures the force exerted onto the human body in the plane by the act of turning. A 3.8 load factor means that the force exerted is 3.8, the weight. It is also a rough measure of the turning radius of the plane. The higher the load factor, the narrower is the turn. Civilian transport planes do not need to be able to withstand load factor above 3.8 because above that level anyway you will break the bones of the people on board. Military planes can reach load factor of 9 or 10 because trained military pilots with proper equipment can withstand those kinds of very high load factors for a very short time. Now, no air-to-air -air missiles has a limit load factor below 10. Most of them are able to 20 or 30 G turns. 
So, a plane simply can't outmaneuver a missile unless... Actually, the plane can outmaneuver a missile, but not in the way that is shown in films and video games. What the pilot of the target plane must do is stay outside of the volume of space where the missile can reach its target. This is basically the most effective defensive tactic of all. Just stay away from the enemy plane and particularly from its frontal section. Head-on engagements that you see in those beautiful DCS gameplays on YouTube actually require very particular conditions to be a good idea in real life. Actual fights with long and medium range weapons tend to resemble a sort of a cautious dance. The pilots try to stay away from the enemy missiles while trying to get in a good position to use their own weapons. Training, but also creativity and intuition and situation awareness are the qualities that are required to come out on top. If, despite your efforts, you are fired at, you may still have good possibility to survive, particularly if the missile has to fly unpowered to get to you. Every time a missile makes a turn, its drag increases and it loses energy and speed. The full engineering explanation, again, is long and nerdy. It is enough to say that the drag, while turning, increases of a non-negligible percentage. The longer the turn or the sharper the turn, the more energy is spent to do the turn. If the engine is on, the energy spent may be regained. If the engine is off, there's no way for the missile to regain the lost energy. Since the missile tends to chase the plane pointing its nose at it, there are exceptions actually, but if the pilot can move in front of the missile, forcing the missile to adjust its course a lot of times, the missile will bleed its energy and it will soon fall off of the sky before reaching the target. If you are still here, there is something that should be clear by now. The ranges that the manufacturer declares for the missile are actually just theory. The missile declared maximum distance is just the distance that the missile can cover, can fly, if released at high speed and high altitude by a platform. The only target that can be reached at that distance is a target that is flying straight toward the missile without maneuvering. So, those comparisons that you find on the internet based on the numbers that you can read on the datasheet are basically meaningless because they describe a tactical situation that is very unlikely to happen in a conflict. Real-life ranges derive from a combination of the factors that we have described before. So, if firing head-on to an approaching target, the range will be the longest, but the pilots still need to consider that the target will probably maneuver to avoid the missile. Just firing to a target that is moving laterally, crossing in front of the shooter, drastically reduces the range. A rule of thumb can be that about 50% of the maximum declared range will be the maximum practical range in this situation. If the target is moving away from the shooter and is showing its target, it is the best situation to shoot, but also the range is the shortest, maybe just 15 or 20% of the maximum range. Actually, the parameters are so many and the calculation is so difficult that modern fighters have a computer that assists the pilot. They project the data on the head-up display and they show when um, a missile is actually in range and has a good probability to reach uh, a target. So, the very good results that Western Air Forces have obtained against Soviet-style Air Forces in the, during the Cold War and uh, more recently have more to do with the training and the ability of Western pilots 
rather than the superiority of the material. While the Soviet has always emphasized the adherence to procedures, NATO pilots have been trained to use their judgment and to try to make the most of their advanced equipment. Modern Russian forces actually have learned the lesson and are changing their approach. However, it is only when launch has a good kinematic probability of success that sensors and guidance systems come into play. Anyway, this is a subject for another video. Now, if you like this video, please like it. If you dislike it, please dislike it. Uh, definitely subscribe and share this on social media. Remember, your girlfriend will be upset if you don't. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.